Another week, boys, and another twab. This week at Bungie, we're back from Thanksgiving. And we've got a few more things we need to wrap up before the new year hit. Not only are we talking about our latest adventure into unknown lands, this time channeling incredible characters from one of Ubisoft's most iconic franchises, we've also got a sneak peek at even more weapon tuning ahead, a fresh look at some new gear, and the community weapon ornament voting has begun with a special sit down with the artist herself to talk about the process coming later this year. Now, just like the previous twabs, here's a quick rundown on what we're going to be chatting about this week before diving right in. More on the exciting new partnership with Ubisoft, Iron Manor, Trials of Cyrus, and Nightfall loot pool updates, weapon philosophy, and more on upcoming changes with senior design lead Chris Proctor, an important update on Hunter Void Invisibility, Season 19 Artifact Preview, also time to vote for your favorite Arbalest ornaments, as well as a bonus interview with the chosen community artist buying the craft that will drop later this week on Friday, and new Prime Gaming drops, as well as a list of known issues. So let's get into it. So starting, we'll meet again, Guardian, in an Altair net universe. In case you missed it, we're getting our stealth on Guardians. Earlier today, we shared our latest venture out into the great unknown once more, this time partnering up with one of Ubisoft's most iconic franchises. To celebrate our latest crossover, we are challenging players to take a leap of faith and embrace the way of the Brotherhood with new cosmetic items that would let you live out your best mysterious hooded figure looking for adventure fantasy. From recent heroes to classic favorites, it's a phenomenal way to get the best of both worlds, plus more fashion. Who would say no to that? Check out the look Look, fellas, oh my god. Yes, this is crossovers into both games. Even better, that Hidden Order love works both ways with Valhalla players enjoying some Destiny 2 themed gear themselves inspired by some of the greatest warriors fighting against the darkness with new armor sets and unique weapons inspired by some of the most iconic weaponry in the world of Destiny. Oh, and a new mount because you can't fight crime if you ain't cute. After all, it technically is still stealth if nobody's left to rat you out to the Templars. I can't believe I gotta go actually play Assassin's Creed if I I want to play a Shaxx, right? The Hell Bungie, a fine evening of Iron Banana and Trials of Osiris with a splash of Nightfall. It's a new season on the horizon, which means more loot to earn. For those guardians with the penchant for a different kind of challenge, there's a new array of weapons to earn. Whether you're heading for the lighthouse or just looking to make O'Sallan and Proud before heading out to run Nightfalls, here's what you can look forward to with the upcoming season. First, Trials of Osiris, what's arriving? The Exalted Truth Surus Adaptive Hand Cannon plus Adept, the Unwavering Duty Surus Adaptive Machine Gun plus Adept. Now, what's Stan, the Whistler's Wimbo, the Forgiveness Sidearm, the Inquisitor, and Burden of Guilt. Now what's leaving? Aisha's Embrace and Reed's Regrets. Guys, I highly advise keeping both of those weapons. They're both very good. Now Iron Banana, what's arriving? The Dark Designer Auto Rifle and the Gnorus Axe Slug Shotgun. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Gnorus coming back. What's staying? Allied Demand, Roar of the Bear, the Wizen Rebuke, Hero's Burden, Frontier's Cry, and Razor's Edge. What's leaving? Forge's Pledge and the Reese Walker Shotgun. Now, I used to say Reese Walker was like the go-to kinetic lightweight shotgun, but no lie guys, Wastelander has become our favorite one. Now Nightfalls, what's arriving? The Windigo Heavy Grenade Launcher. Hung Jury is also making a return. What's leaving? Silicon Aroma and the Duty Bound Auto Rifle. By the way, don't sleep on Duty Bound. Fantastic PV Auto Rifle, fellas. I still wish I can poke people with it though, right? That and Monte Carlo. One more thing, we also have a shiny new Season 19 ornaments for ritual activities like Gambit, Crucible, and Vanguard Strikes. Feast your eyes on more activity-themed fashion for the upcoming season and marvel at our ability to always come in hot with that clutch green snakeskin look. Ah oh, yes, look at that. Sexy and hockey, right? Interesting. Pulse rifle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now weapon philosophy and the art of running diff. With a new season on the horizon, a fine weapons tuning update is just what Banshee ordered. We've got senior design lead Chris Proctor back to chat about more tweaks to come play that Guardians should know about. From an accessibility standpoint, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. The full auto toggle that has been implemented as one of the changes we're particularly excited for. But that's just one small part of a bigger update. From web and philosophy to global goals, here's what Chris had to say about what's next. So from Chris, first up, if you haven't looked at the weapons twop since season 18, you may want to catch up on the Festival of the Lost mid-season 6.2.5 weapons balance update, which can be found here, which has important info for what's coming next. Additionally, several hot fixes landed over the course of the current season, one of which included the following balance changes. Reduce aim assist on special ammo linear fusion rifles. Apply previous sniper flitch changes to linear fusion rifles. Again, that was actually slated for next season season and they ship those things out early. By the way, if you happen to miss that twa, we will link that in the description below. You can watch it right after this one. Now global, we've seen some very positive player responses to the full auto retrofit mod over the past several seasons. Because of that, we have added full auto toggle to the gameplay section of the settings menu that will be going live with the launch of season 19. This setting will allow for all weapons to become fully automatic. We'll be watching how players end up using this and are looking into additional ways for players to pick which types of weapons this setting applies to sometime after life fall. For now, 
now we have this new toggle. On a related note, we're also aware that certain melees also require speedy clicking and are looking at something similar for a subset. For example, glaive, sword, and roaming super melees, though currently not regularly charged and uncharged melees. Ah, so essentially you'll be able to just sit there and lay on the trigger and melee over and over. I like it. Now again, I personally like to tap fire most of my weapons outside of maybe automatic weapons, but even autos, I'll tap fire just to maintain recoil. This is a great change though, especially for controller players. You won't have to actually keep a full auto mod on. It's an accessibility thing now. It's literally a setting that you can toggle on and off. So pull down on that trigger, fellas. Keep that finger rested. Now weapon archetypes. We pulled quite a few weapon archetypes changes from season 19 into the previously referenced 6.2.5 update. So this section is smaller than it would otherwise have been. That said, we have some substantial changes here, particularly to shotguns and glaives. So it's worth diving into if weapon theory is your thing. Now shotguns. Shotguns were previously able to one hit kill from too far away and needed adjustment. Once that was addressed, the weakness of random pellet spread became clear. They've become less reliable, even at close ranges. This gave us a solid starting point to do something we have been looking into for a while, giving each shotgun subfamily a custom fixed spread pattern and a matching custom reticle. Each of these spread patterns is intended to give a subfamily a unique style of gameplay and predictable effectiveness at specific ranges. Interesting, all right? Now the reticles are tuned to match the size of the actual spread pattern at the default field of view, but note that this is not the case as field of view changes or as spread angle changes. Like if you're jumping, for example. Oh yeah, yeah, that thing. We'll update reticles to react dynamically to spread angle in lightfall and field of view in a later release. But this first step was crucial for getting that prep for implementation in the future. And the changes listed evolved the experience of using a shotgun so much that we expect to revisit tuning on these over the next few seasons. That's okay. Tailoring to different play styles while maintaining a balance takes time, but we're on a good path. Also, note that we have held off on adjusting fusion rifles because the balance between shotguns and fusion rifles depends a lot on how these changes work out after season 19 launches. The numbers, Mason, what do they mean? Now here are the spread patterns for each shotgun subfamily. Oh boy. All right. Aggressive, fixed, evenly distributed cone. Okay. Precision includes dualities, hip fire. Interesting. Vertical oval. Ah, you may be thinking to yourself, cross. That's like the shape of a guardian. You're right. Lightweight, diamond. Okay. Rapid fire, square. And then slug shotgun being its circle self because it's just a single shot. Now notice that the reticle changes though. Like literally, it changes with the spread, which is really amazing. And shotguns have never done this. It's just like random. Hence why sometimes you get a kill at certain ranges and then sometimes you don't. This is an amazing change though. The fact that this is actually distributed per archetype of shotgun. Now additional changes. Aggressive. Fix several shotguns that were using the incorrect intrinsic aggressive part. All aggressive shotguns will now increase rate of fire after a kill as intended. Okay, so yes, yeah, some shotguns, more specifically like Felwinner's Lie, which is an aggressive shotgun, came with shot package as its aggressive perk or its intrinsic perk, which just stated more uniform pellet spread. I think there was like a few others too. Anyways, regardless, aggressors by default increases the rate of fire after getting a kill, combating that slow default RPM of 55. Now, rapid fires, they increase the PVE damage by 5%. The reload speed benefit for rapid fire shotgun frames now will always apply instead of only when reloading from an empty magazine. This is a huge buff, guys. Considering rapid fire frames normally have deep mags, you don't have to go to that final shot in order to get the increase in that reload speed. Now, sidearms. Sidearms are now much more viable in PvP since the 6.2.5 buff to this weapon type's auto aim fall off distance, but this caused a notable over buff to drain, allowing it to compete too far outside of sidearm range. So we're reducing the zoom stat on drain from 14 to 13. Fellas, you had to see it was coming. Not that drain is like ruining the crucible, but it does surpass many other sidearms in that range category. Nobody look at Forerunner. Fusion rifle. Now onto fusion rifles. Main ingredient is still wildly effective as a rangy fusion rifle due to being able to roll with stability perks in both columns. We've adjusted some of those perks, but we don't want to poke at them further if it isn't needed. So we're actually just adjusting the slightly out of band stats of this weapon directly. So we're reducing the stability from 49 to 35 and reducing the aim assist stat from 59 to 45. Now fusion rifle reticles don't react much to changing accuracy due to firing or jumping, even when I'm mouse and keyboard and in a high field of view. So we rebuilt the fusion rifle hit fire reticle so that it reacts more obviously to changes in the accuracy cone. Interesting. I have been seeing more people actually use fusion rifle from the air and surprisingly pretty effectively. My question here is this just like more of a feedback thing like hey accuracy is dropping off therefore let's show the bloom out. I know a lot of people use monitors these days though that have reticles already in place like they don't even look at their in-game reticles right like it's displayed on their monitor. I don't have it on mine for some reason my Alienware monitor doesn't have it. You think this expensive monitor would? Regardless of curious to see how these fusion rifle reticles actually change how fusion rifles are being used if at all. Glaives. Glaives 
Blade projectiles have not hit our quality bar for hit registration yet, so we have reworked them. We're also loosening the restrictions on some melee damage exotics and have adjusted base melee damage and some PvE damage scalers to avoid degenerate damage multipliers. So Glade projectiles have been adjusted for more reliable hit detection over the network. Ah, uh, yes, the Matrix. Glade melee attacks can now benefit from the exotic armor perks on Syntheseps, Worm God Caress, and Winter's Guile. That is a huge buff, fellas. Also, Glade melee damage multipliers reduced by 25 to 30% against champions, mini bosses, bosses, and vehicles. Damage against majors and minor enemies is unchanged. Well, that sucks. Reduced by 25 to 30%. What? So you synergize it with our exotics, but then you nerf it against champions? Glade melee base damage has also been reduced from 75 to 67. Okay, whatever. All right, we're gonna have to see how good this hit registration actually is inside of PvP. But if you got the balls to push a champion with a glaive, by all means, let the man do full damage. Hand cannons. When we updated stats for hand cannons that used to be lightweights, now adaptives, we didn't touch Rose. Now that Rose is returning, we've adjusted its stats for smoother reintegration. So we updated Rose's stats to work for an adaptive hand cannon. This was definitely a question we had. We had a video here recently on the possible return of 150s, considering Rose is going to be a hybrid. Our concern was that the stats were going to be poor. But looky here, man, they increased the range from 38 to 43. They also reduced the stability from 45 to 40, which does hurt. And they reduced the handling from 68 to 60. They also gave it an airborne effectiveness of 20. Question comes up, is that extra five range going to make all the difference? Again, guys, handling being reduced from 68 to 60. Understand intrinsically, it will still be a lightweight. So by default, the handling is going to be performing better anyways, intrinsically. And as far as stability goes, yes, it does suck going from 45 to 40, but we're also going to have the opportunity to roll grips on this hand cannon, similar to like Hawkmoon. So you will be able to roll grips that will be able to widely fluctuate the stability and handling stat. Now, blinding effects, grenade launchers, the queen breaker and grand overture all previously used the older blinding screen effect, which players have reported could feel jarring and pose some photosensitivity concerns. So they switched these to the new arc blind effect, which is significantly reduced screen effect brightness and is overall less intrusive. All right, so for my guys that were getting too blinded, should be better now for like the one person using queen breakers bow. Weapon mods, weapon mods that increase the effects of weapon perks do not make for interesting decisions. So we've made a long awaited and long requested change to them. The dragonfly, rampage, and surrounded perks now have all their spec mod behaviors enabled by default. Oh! All right, guys, so this essentially means Dragonfly got a buff, Rampage got a buff, Surrounded especially got a buff. All of these will intrinsically work by default. Rampage will last longer, Dragonfly will have bigger explosion, Surrounded will actually get both a buff and a duration buff, considering the damage buff itself will persist outside of combat. Good, good changes here. Now, perks, reworks. We're not happy with how the prior redesign of Air Assault turned out. So we've taken a second pass at it. It now directly rewards success and is much more dependable for players. Air Assault now grants a stacking bonus to airborne effectiveness. Maximum of two stacks, one per final blow, two per airborne final. Each stack is plus 30 airborne effectiveness. By God, Bungie really wants us to use air assault. And I guess I'm going to have to because it doesn't look like AE is going to change anytime soon. So I guess air assault is now meta. Headseeker has been a boring and questionable useful perk on most pulse rifles for quite a while. So we have redesigned it. Body shots now increase your precision multiplier and increase aim assist. Additional body shots reset the timer. And then it says period one. Is that point one? What? Bungie, what's happening here? Is that one second? Am I getting that right? Somebody explain this. It has a 0.55 second base timer. Body shots, while head seeker is active, will reset the timer. All right, so I don't know what that one is for, but okay. Body shots will increase the precision multiplier. The big one is, of course, the increasing there of aim assist. 0.55 seconds after the first burst being body shots, which is really easy to get on any burst fire weapon, pretty much concludes the entire fight, right? TTK values are like 0.8 seconds, so the second shot will 100% take full advantage of this and depending on the rate of fire if you're actually leaning into multi kills on enemies that are stacking on each other this should all be benefiting itself but again additional body shots while head seeker is active resets the timer so you can just keep chaining over and over and another mainly specifying pulse rifles and head seeker but understand head seeker is also present on the weapons most notably a sidearm out there which we talked about this will benefit from this change on course initial implementation was a little complex and fiddly to use so we redesigned that one too final blows now grant stacks of encore and stacks grant increased stability, range, and accuracy. Body shot final blows grant one stack. Precision final blows grant two stacks with a maximum of four stacks. It will last seven whole seconds with enhanced lasting seven and a half. Final blows will refresh the timer. The benefits? Eight stability, five range, and 1.25% accuracy per stack. That's huge. Encore just became meta. Holy hell. Now, serve rounds will be appearing on more weapons next season, but in its current form, it is the strongest magazine perk by a large margin. So we pulled it back a little and made it more of a trade 
trade off. We removed the 10% range scaler. Now offers plus seven stability as well as plus three range. Fellas, if you remember way back when, and it's interesting, they're mentioning Seraph rounds, which was only present on Ikelos weapons, which may lead us to believe we might get a season of Rasputin, which we just talked about, literally just talked about in our video yesterday. Okay, back to Seraph rounds though. Seraph rounds, which were present on Ikelos weapons, increased literally the range scaler by a large margin. So imagine a magazine perk that increased the zoom without actually increasing the zoom. It 100% was superior in comparison to Agarath's rounds and Ricochet rounds. Now the plus seven stability and plus three range, that's an interesting one. It's not as good as Ricochet rounds. Ricochet rounds actually gives you plus 10 stability and plus five range. So it, it actually comes under Ricochet rounds. My question is, will it have the ability to have increased damage against barrier champions? Considering Seraph rounds is supposed to be a combination of armor piercing rounds and Ricochet rounds and also has the flinch of high caliber rounds. So will it still retain those abilities, arm piercing, ricochet, and high cal with the potential to do extra damage to barrier champions on top of those stat benefits? It would be nice. I hope so, Bungie. That's like the identity of Seraph rounds, right? So I hope they don't mess with that. The 10% range scaler, completely understand that was too powerful. To this day, man, I never got the God Roll Ikelos SMG. Dynamic sway. Tap the trigger. Seraph rounds, baby. If you had that roll, you were one lucky guardian. Now, tunnel vision plus kill clip. Not being refreshable while active has always been counterintuitive. So we've actually now set them to allow that. That being said, this does make Kill Clip too strong compared to other damage perks. So we pulled it back a little. The duration of these buffs can now be refreshed if activated while already active. So we reduced Kill Clip damage bonus from 33% to now 25%. Okay, that does hurt. That's a nerf. Ain't no two ways to look at that. It's a nerf. Ease of use, it is a buff though. Again, similar to multi Kill Clip, you get a kill, you can reload, you get another kill, you can instantly reload. There's no wait period. There's no swapping to another weapon to rinse the trait, then swapping back and reloading. So it really just comes down to you guys. What would you prefer? 33% or ease of use? This is a bungee game. You don't have have a choice so you're getting ease of use redirection didn't use our standard method of checking for weak versus strong enemies so we've actually changed it to be consistent with other perks since it'll be appearing on more weapons most notably deep stone crypt weapons which are actually coming to us as craftable weapons next season redirection will now build stacks against red bar enemies and consume them on everything else that is matches minor spec and other perks that use similar language all right so redirection no one really like jumped out of their way to get redirection essentially it grants 20 percent increased damage to medium and high tier combatants per stack up to 100% at five stacks. It also consume one stack per hit if at or below five stack and consumes five stacks per hit if at or above six stacks. And it can go all the way up to 20 stacks. And I feel like right now I've already lost most of you. My understanding from this, it will build stacks against red bar enemies and consumes them on literally everything else. So to my understanding, more ease of use. I will admit I never really go out of my way to use redirection, perhaps now. And yes, there will be an enhanced version to redirection next season interested to know if that's actually going to change damage percentages at all. Light GG is not really displaying anything for that as of now. Now buffs. We want players to be able to use the Hockey Breach Armament's Origin trait to bring down Ward of Dawn, as well as Well of Radiance and Stasis Crystals in PvP. Now increase damage versus Ward of Dawn and Well of Radiance sword by 30% and 60% with the Artifact mod. Good God! You telling me I could sit right there with my trusty O Perseus D and 1v1 a bubble? No lie, I'm going to try. Now the damage bonus against Stasis Crystals has also been increased by 15%, both base and with the artifact mod. Now, Gutshot straight shipped a little weak on auto rifles, so we actually bumped it up a little. We increased the bonus to auto rifle damage from 10% to now 20%. Holy hell. Now I'm going to have to go through all my rolls again, start looking at Gutshot straight. Listen, Gutshot straight is really not that wonderful considering the drawbacks, right? It decreases target acquisition. However, enhanced Gutshot straight is much better. It only slightly decreases target acquisition. So the 20% extra damage there might be really nice. And there are certain weapons out there that already have Gutshot Straight that with the enhanced version might be really good. You've got Ammit. You've got the BXR. Smite of Moraine. Dude, imagine if Smite had Gutshot Straight and Headseeker, right? Holy hell. The power! Now, Compulsive Reloader's reload speed benefit is enjoyable, but on certain weapon types, it doesn't remain active deep enough into a magazine. So now it will remain active down to half the ammo. Compulsive Reloader, fellas, will be able to go deeper. Giggity. The high impact frame intrinsic part can be hard to use since it switches off with a little movement. We've tweak this so that slow movement, for example, crouching and strafing, doesn't deactivate the perk. Oh, thank God. Now allows a small amount of movement instead of turning off with any movement. That is one of my biggest complaints about high impacts. Bungie's like, yo, stand completely
absolutely steal if you're looking to get the benefits of this intrinsic trait. And by the way, for those that don't know, high impact, which is literally our high impact weapons, states that the weapon is more accurate when stationary and aiming down sights. Look, I just made a joke about Perseus D being meta against Bubbles. Do Perseus D might actually just be the meta against everything. Ambitious Assassin's recent adjustment gives it a remarkably higher potential for overflowing a magazine. But in areas with sparse enemies, it can be hard to chain kills quickly enough. So we're increasing the allowed time between kills from five seconds to now seven seconds. Oh, for well-rounded, the duration increased from 10 seconds to now 15 seconds. Stacking the effect still resets the timer. For those that are like, yo, what the hell is that perk? I've never heard of it. It's okay, no one's really that crazy about well-rounded. Essentially though, throwing a grenade or hitting a target with a charged melee grants improved stacking bonuses to weapon stability, handling, and range. Now, depending on your build, there is a way to passively always be procking well-rounded. You can literally rock Honkor's spine, throw out a knife, plant a trip mine grenade somewhere, and there you go. You've got 15 seconds of increased weapon stability, handling, and range. So again, very dependent on your build. I'm actually interested in trying out well-rounded with that increase of five seconds there on its base duration. Recombination has some reliability issues. So we made some tweaks and adjusted the damage. This was important since this is now available on new weapons. Tweaks to make this function in PvP as intended. Now grants up to 100% bonus damage at max stacks in PvE, 50% in PvP. All right, so recombination, guys. A phenomenal perk. Elemental final blows increase the damage of this weapon's next shot. Guys, I'm gonna be honest. I have never really actually took the time to use recombination inside of PvP. So I'm not even sure what they're talking about when it said it wasn't functioning as intended. Now, somebody wants to detail down below what this really changes here. Again, I thought it was 100% inside of PvE already. Now, I know Heritage was like 88% inside of PvE, Succession was 100%, but for both Heritage and Succession, it was 50%. Again, though, we'll see how this plays out. Maybe it's gonna be present on other weapons outside of these two. And again, we're also gonna be getting an enhanced version of Recombination. So yeah, should be interesting. Moving on, Zim Moment will provide an extraordinarily strong, if not well understood, reduction to recoil angle. But missing would reset the perk completely, making it difficult to sustain. Now, it will no longer deactivate on a miss. Now it has a one second time. Is this enough to make us use Zim Moments? Again, a mouse and keyboard, probably not. Control the players? By all means, man, go crazy. As part of the work on Divinity this season, we looked at other related hiccups, including rerun rounds. Rerun rounds now work as intended when hitting the cage created by Divinity. Also, Genesis has always refilled weapons ammo on breaking shields in PvE, but that hasn't been the case in PvP. We've determined that it was a safe call to make to remove this restriction entirely. It will now trigger on breaking player shields. Just in time, right? Law, can you imagine Arbalest pre-nerfed with Genesis auto-reloading the weapon on it? Dear baby Jesus, one quiet moment. Wasn't really doing the job of providing fast reloads out of combat in cases where a player has dealt with all nearby threats. So we made the following change. Faster reactivation after a final blow. By the way, guys, one quiet moment. That is an origin trait that nobody really cares to use, but it grants increased reload speed when out of combat. Now, should activate faster. Gun and run was also hard to trigger in PvP or encounters with few enemies. So we've also decided to half the number of final blows needed to activate this when going up against most enemy types. And for my three people that still play Gambit, you'll be happy to know this origin trait is getting a buff. Dude, I've got one guy right now spit shining his hair at sea. Like, yeah, I've been waiting for this moment. Nerves! Oh yeah, you thought you were gonna get through a twab without some nerves? Not today! Box breathing has been providing too strong of a benefit for too little investment on scout rifles. So we pulled it back a smidge to avoid crossing time to kill thresholds. Reduce damage bonus on scout rifles by 5%. Yeah, because box breathing was just so out of hand. Obviously, this is being targeted at hung jury. It's coming back to us. Fellas, that TTK value of what? What was it? 0.67 that we used to be able to achieve there with hung jury. And of course, its predecessor, no feelings, no more. Say goodbye. Unstoppable forces damage was a little too high for the level of investment, surpassing other damage perks for strength and uptime. We're keeping the uptime, but adjusting the damage, reducing damage bonus from 30% to now 20%. That's right, Glaive users. Get wrecked. One, two punch. Oh no, not one, two punch, Bungie. What is you doing? One, two punch is one part of several combos that allow stacking melee damage buffs to get far higher than intended. Here's what one, two punch will look like. Reduce bonus melee damage as follows from three times to two times versus most enemies with unpowered melees from 1.8 to 1.4 versus most enemies with charged melees and reduce the additional bonus versus bosses from 0.5 to 0.25. All right. Yeah, it's a nerf. Ain't no other way to look at it. It hurts. Bug fixes to excess, which are opulent weapons origin traits. Triggering this perk across multiple weapons no longer displays a stack encounter on the UI. This perk never stacked its effects. So this change does not change its behavior. By the way, that trait final blows of this weapon while your super is full grants bonus to strength and discipline for a moderate duration. If you got baited by the UI, so did I. Enhanced perks. We've taken a pass over several enhanced perks to bring the functionality more in line with the base perks. Enhanced unrelenting. Shifted to plus five health regeneration. Remove plus five handling. Enhanced perpetual motion. Remove the 0.1 second fast
faster activation and remove the 1.2 second grace period upon ending. Add it one second faster activation of two stacks. All right, so you can get that two stack slightly faster. Sometimes one second, fellas, makes all the difference. If you know, you know. Enhanced time payload. Shift it from range to plus five stability. Well, considering explosive payload already gives you no damage fall off, I'll take it. Enhanced explosive payload. Shift it from range to plus five reload. All right. Enhanced firing line. Add an additional tin handling when in proximity. Removed increased neutral range. Enhanced grave robber. Swap plus five reload to plus five handling. That makes sense. Enhanced explosive lights. Add in one more charge. Stack caps at seven. Oh, just in time for when to go. Enhanced corner. Added plus 10 stability when active. Enhanced cold steel. Oh, the most meta trait in the game. Weapon energy and weapon magazine capacity. Now add plus 10 to be consistent with other ammo capacity increasing perks. If you don't know what cold steel is, you obviously don't like Christmas. Enhanced vorpal weapon. Change from plus five reload to plus five stability. This will apply to the guard resistance stat on swords. Enhanced genesis. Remove primary ammo overflow. Added additional handling. Enhanced flash counter. Increase ammo capacity. Really, Bungie? Why not increase like not getting stomped in the face considering that's literally its identity like maybe something to combat stomp mechanics so i can continue sorting my enemy enhanced chain reaction updated the description as this provides a different benefit to swords enhanced ambitious assassin increase allow time between final blows from six seconds to now eight seconds now exotics reworks oh boy i'm ready we identified a handful of weapons that we felt needed a substantial change to really hit the level of exoticness that we expect from destiny 2 exotics the fundamentals perk which can be seen on the damage type switching exotics Borealis, Hard Light, and Dead Messenger, while Functional felt like it would do more to grant the modes some identity based on selected damage types. So each damage type now grants different weapon stats. Link Elemental Capacitor, if that perk checked that damage type, on the weapon instead of player subclass. So added stats to each element. Arc, plus 25 handling and plus 5 range. Solar, plus 35 reload speed and plus 20 airborne effectiveness. And Void, plus 20 stability and plus 10 aim assist. Oh my god, fellas, hard light? Dude, if we actually had a 600 round per minute auto rifle meta, can you imagine hard light with even more stability? But Cross, it used to have 100 stability before it got nerfed. Yes, that's why I say, can you imagine? Now, even with the change to fundamentals, we felt like Borealis needed a more substantial change. Breaking a match shield now refills the magazine from reserves and allows your next five shots to deal bonus damage, not deactivated by reloading. Perhaps this is gonna make Borealis meta. I personally love to use it in Gambit back in the day. Essentially, break a shield, invade, give one shot body shot kills. Don't think that's gonna be possible still, even with this change. However, who is playing Gambit in 2022, am I right? Jade Rabbit is a strong scout rifle, but his exotic perk was lackluster. So we redesigned it to be more of a gameplay loop. Quickly landing three crits, returns around to the magazine, and increases the damage of your next body shot. It stacks up to three increased damage body shots and resets if you reload. Now, let me go ahead and bring up some here. Although I am looking forward to this change. Understand, it wasn't that we found that Jade Rabbit's exotic perk was lackluster. It was just buggy as it just wasn't consistently procking. But hey, yeah, sure, lackluster. Nerfs, three weapons dominate raid exotic weapon usage, largely because of their effectiveness and ammo efficiency. Now, looky here, we have raid exotic weapon usage, November the 15th. With a horde, divinity, and arbless, mother of God, Bungie, do not nerf with a horde, do not. I told you guys to calm down and raids. Quit using Wither Horde. For example, looking at raid exotic weapon usage back in November the 15th, the chart shows each weapon's share of all exotic weapon usage in raids. It's clear that Arbalest, Divinity, and Wither Horde are extremely popular. Divinity coming right behind Arbalest is no accident. But an entire team of six players in a raid only needs a single Divinity. So it's even more popular than it looks when simply looking at the numbers. Another interesting aspect of this data is that Divinity ownership is roughly half the number of those who own Arbalest and Wither Horde. That number were to go up, popularity of the weapon would also increase. Now, PvP exotic weapon usage, November the 15th. What the hell? Wither Horde is that high? I don't believe these numbers. Somebody's cooking the books, man. Now, Wither Horde is extremely strong in both PvE and PvP, dealing high damage quickly and for an extended duration. We are making changes to direct hits, and we're leaving the damage and ammo capacity alone. But since this weapon in its current iteration is too strong in PvE, not to mention that the Taken Portal is difficult to deal with in PvP, we've made the following changes. Reduce Taken Portal duration from 7.5 seconds to 4.5 seconds. Cross, is that a nerf? Yes, it's a nerf. Regarding Divinity, this is a must-have weapon in in-game PvE. That said, the combination of the strongest possible weakened effects, the cage making critical hits trivial, and the intrinsic overload being too strong, as is evident in looking at how this weapon is used in instances like Raid, it was time for a change. We looked at several options, including making the weapon harder to use or reducing its uptime by bringing its ammo down. But ultimately, felt that its identity is all about making damage phases more enjoyable. Cage uptime remains the same, and we brought the weakened strength down to match other standard weaknesses in the game. 
It's also important to call out that you can still apply a 30% weakened debuff with the cage by combining Divinity with Tether or Tractor Cannon. So it will reduce Divinity's weaken from 30% to 15%, but it still self buffs to 30% because that really matters. The Div user puts in so much damage. Now, Arbalest missed out on the body shot damage reduction that Lawrence Driver received, making it too easy to get one hit body shots in PvP while not requiring enough precision in PvE. So we reduce the body shot damage to match Lawrence Driver. My Girl Falcon users are shaking their fists. Galorn is the highest DPS rocket launcher and a great support weapon for legendary rocket launchers. So we picked one of those two roles and opted to lean into its support power. Reduce primary rocket impact detonation damage by 25%. Wolfpack rounds are unaffected. This just brings it into the desired band without nerfing it past other rocket launchers. Again, they want you to use Galahorn more as a support rocket launcher for other rocket launchers, considering it grants Wolfpack rounds to those legendary rockets. I will say, it's not like we haven't seen this before. Literally, the circle of life. Destiny 1, Galahorn, super meta, nerfed. Destiny 2, super meta, or I wouldn't even say super meta, but very good, now nerfed. Granted, not as substantially so as it was back inside of D1, or at least we hope. Forerunner received an unintended and relatively small damage buff in Season 18's balance update that made it a little too easy to use. After the change, all it took for a final blow was one crit and three body shots, or five body shots in PvP. Here's what we've changed for Season 19. Reduce Forerunner's base damage from 40 to 37, and crit damage from 72 to 67. All right, you're still gonna build a three tap, guys, so nobody freak out. Now buffs. We track exotic weapon popularity when deciding what exotic weapons to buff by looking at how many active players own a weapon and how much they use it in game. Ah, so look at the stats here, guys. What well, we do know, no one likes to use Merciless. Wow. Come on, fellas. This is the lowest 20 exotic usage by owners. Typically, we choose from the 20 or so of the least popular weapons for a potential buff, either directly or via a catalyst addition. In this case, we've adjusted some that have languished for years and others we simply felt strongly about. We have more of these types of changes coming in Lightfall, though we'll share those in a later update. With the addition of full auto settings, we're replacing the full auto trigger system perk on each exotic that had it. No time to explain. Replace with Feeding Frenzy. Traveler's Chosen, Catalyst perk, replace with Surplus. It still has Osmosis. Vision Swing, Catalyst perk, replace with Ensemble. I will say no time to explain in Traveler's Chosen. Great buffs there. We fixed an issue where crits from Dead Man's Tail were landing inconsistently depending on whether your aim was above or below the target. We've also made some small changes to its base damage, which will apply to all 120 round per minute scout rifles now prefers critical hits over body hits and hip fire if both types of targets are inside the precision aim cone. Also increase body shot damage from 46 to 54 and reduce crit damage from 81 to 80. The hell? Why? Why? I mean, just one damage, but why? I just wish Cranial Spike did more damage again, right? Like, obviously the trade-off was not good. Granted, maybe now that it's going to prefer critical hits over body hits while in hip fire mode, perhaps we'll actually be able to take advantage of that times five Cranial Spike. By the way, we also re-reviewed Dead tell Bungie kill that thing. I don't think this is going to revive it, but we'll see. We've also been looking for a way to help Darcy players. We know many Guardians would like it to move to the energy slot, but there's plenty of competition for sniper rifles there, even exotics. With the below change, it's a more interesting choice in the heavy slot. Now applies Jolt when damaging targets affected by personal assistance. Also increase base airborne effectiveness to 80. That's so random. Who the hell is sniping from the air inside of PvE? Now, nah, we'll say Jolt's pretty nice. All right, so yeah, we did the review on the seasonal linear infusion rifle, sales by pitch glass with volt shots, which requires you to reload the weapon after defeating a target to then overcharge it to then cause jolt to the next target you hit. However, here Darcy is just going to be able to do it with personal assistant, which by the way, immediately activates when you aim at an enemy. So this may actually make Darcy really, really good. Now, Wish Ender has always had a hidden damage bonus versus targets affected by Wither Horde due to its identity as a taken hunter's weapon. So increased bonus versus Wither Horde blinded targets from 10% to 25%. Ah, for that one teammate rocking with the horde after its nerf. Really, really though, Wish Ender is actually really good inside of PvE. Now, while we don't want special ammo snipers to be perfectly accurate from the air without significant investment, we don't have the same concerns with their heavy ammo counterparts. That's where this whisper of the worm change comes in. Increase base airborne effectiveness to 80. Oh, yes. I can't wait. Whisper, you're meta, baby. The Prospector has surprisingly high burst damage, but ultimately doesn't excel enough at add clear or DPS for it to have a secure place. With the below change, it is substantially more effective at ad clear, though we will continue to monitor when it's live in game. Add a chain reaction to its intrinsic perk, holy hell? Say no more. I use Prospector next season. By with the horn, the fourth horseman has some niche uses, but ultimately suffers from extremely hard to control recoil, which we've pulled back. Decreased recoil by 50%. Oh, thank God. I can actually see what I'm shooting with that thing. No lie though, fourth horseman is the epitome of blowing your load. Forerunner is a fun weapon in PvE, but it's never been a top pick. 
changes to the weapon and its grenade should make it a lot more viable. Increase the crit damage by 30% and the rocks damage by 60% in PvE. Also reduce ammo cost to activate the rock from 6 to 4. Increase damage at the outer edge of the rock's damage radius from 0% to 20%. Holy hell. Forerunner? I, I may actually use it, guys. Again, the exotic catalyst allows you to essentially convert ammo into a grenade. That's going to be doing substantial damage. My only request is I wish the grenade would synergize with one of our subclasses. Granted, it's a kinetic weapon, so that's probably not possible. But still, good changes here. We might actually use Forerunner inside of PvE. Merciless is extraordinarily strong when ramped up, but it's hard to keep it in that state. So Merciless decreased charge time on hit now resets on a five second timer. This timer is refreshed when you land hits. So you have five whole seconds. And again, Merciless requires you to land non-lethal hits. So essentially you don't kill the target. And in doing so, you have that decreased charge time. At least to my knowledge, this just means that decrease in charge time will have well, like 100% uptime until of course you get a kill and then you have to reload and then you have impetus, which is buffing your damage. So it's a win-win. Rat King is a lot of fun to use, but the allowed distance from allies feels a little too strict as it stands. So Radius required to activate his perk increased from 15 meters to now 20 meters. Legend of Acris has some movement penalties to make it feel weightier. Oh yeah, it's Big Chungus, man. We think that the feel of using the weapon does that sufficiently though. So this is what Acris users can look forward to. Remove movement penalties. Do y'all remember when Acris was meta? Like literally, it was the PvP meta. It was like the best weapon to shut down supers. Bastion season 14 nerf was a little more than it needed. So we've happed it. Reduce the spread angle by 6%. Ah yes. Bastion, you coming back, baby? Quicksilver Storm and its grenade intentionally shipped on the weak side. We wanted to see what the uptime of grenades was like in the wild rather than ship them too strong, but we believed it's safe to increase the damage and the radius a fair bit. We've also fixed a bug with the rockets. They weren't intended to be arc, and this bug on change would interfere with the catalyst coming in life off. So we increased PvP maximum grenade damage from 80 to now 120 and increased the explosion radius from 3 meters to now 4 meters. That's actually really good. Also switched the rocket damage from arc to now kinetic. I know guys, the burn damage, it was nice. Now Cold Heart's arc 3.0 rework wasn't generous enough with ionic traces so we reduced the cooldown on ionic traces generation from 3.5 seconds to now two seconds now maxes out stability and reload speed when at maximum damage picking up an ionic traces now reduces the time it takes to get to max damage grand overtures loop doesn't feel rewarding enough in its current form so we've dramatically increased the reward increased missile damage by 50 percent holy hell fellas i've been saying for a while now that grand overture is actually really good for arc burns omega strike is more consistent Consistent and allows you to bring it from target to target. The blinding there from its catalyst, that 50% buff is going to be very nice here for those missiles. Xenophage only deals area of effect damage currently, which causes issues against some enemies in PvE. We're not changing the overall weapon much, but we are addressing that pesky PvE issue. Despite benefiting from solid ease of use, we felt that its damage could be a little higher. Now it deals roughly half of its damage as impact damage, and the rest is detonation. The overall damage has been increased by 5%. All right, we'll see. Xenophage literally was the meta like every grandmaster we were using it which of course it got some hefty nerfs arguably one of the biggest nerfs to xenophage is that warmind cells just aren't as good as they used to be and that was like one of the biggest benefits to xenophage it could produce warmind cells with certain mods now when adjusting divinity we also looked at some bugs related to it including clown strike the lightning storm will now correctly activate when hitting divinity's cage all right moving on armor some exotic armor pieces were part of combinations allowing extremely high damage output from melee attacks in pve so we brought a couple of these down versus ultra enemy health. Worm God Caress reduced maximum damage multiplier from 7.5 to 3.5. Winter's God reduced maximum damage multiplier from 7.5 to 3.5. All right, so hefty nerfs, big time. I would be okay with these nerfs if we saw duration buffs, like more ease of use, less damage. And as a Titan, I'm just going to use Syntheseps more, right? Note on Gurf Falcon's Harbrick. We have a change coming in 6.3.0.1. Here's a sneak preview of the changes that we believe will address balance concerns in PvP while maintaining a clear identity in the void space. Gain volatile rounds when exiting invisibility. Holy hell. When executing a finisher while invisible, this exotic now gives nearby allies a reserve over shield and give the wearer a temporary bonus to weapon damage. What? So Gert Falcon is about to be like one of the best PvE exotics on top of PvP. Now things players can look forward to in the future. A heavy weapon damage rebalance. Tinkering with bringing some less effective options while bringing some damage outliers down. What's the life all DPS meta? Mysterious. A large rebalance of the airborne effectiveness stat, making primary ammo weapons significantly more accurate 
while airborne without the investment in the stats. Think increased level accuracy from before season 17. Specifics are still in development. Bungie, please, for the love of God, make this a thing as soon as possible. Some tweaks to the new shotgun reticles and a pass at adding subclass 3.0 verbs to several exotic weapons. There are currently seven, which is a big jump from three. Now, Void Hunter walks into a bar, but you probably didn't see them. Law. We all, at least at one point or another in our lives, wish for the power of invisibility. With great power comes great responsibility. You're a real one, Uncle Ben. The PvP community has spoken and they've said, y'all, something's got to change with the power of invisibility when going up against other guardians. Here to chat about the exact topic is Sandbox designer Mike Humboldt. So from Mike here, hey everyone, with update 6.3.0.1 scheduled to be released with the week of December the 13th, we're moving up a change to void invisibility to help reduce its power and high level crucible activities. For full context, we feel it's necessary to provide some background information on how Radar and Destiny 2 works. So the Radar and Destiny 2 is actually divided into three range defining sections. A close range core, which covers a range of zero to six meters that pings any time an enemy, invisible or not, is within its range. The mid range pie wedges covering the six to 24 meter range. The gutter or the outer ring of the radar, which starts at 24 meters and has a maximum search range of 64 meters. After update 6.3.0.1, when a player is invisible, their maximum radar range will be reduced to 24 meters and they won't have access to the information in the gutter range until they are visible again. I think that's pretty fair, guys. Not bad. We'll have to see how it shakes out. Granted, I know most people are like, yo, everyone that's going invisible, it's normally in close range to begin with. Why wouldn't they just reduce the uptime of invisibility? I would think that's the next step. Like if this doesn't solve it, the next step is actually reversing its uptime. Now, while 24 meters sounds like a long range on paper, our playtest showed this reduction in information availability has a significant impact on how invisible players approach engagements and allows potential targets more chance to get the drop on an invisible aggressor. It also offers a way to reposition when they hear the audio cue for invisibility. We found this change has minimum impact on invisibility's role inside of PVE. As always, we'll be keeping an eye on this as it drops and monitoring feedback and adjust further if needed. All right, moving on season 19 artifact mods here for a good time, not a long time. It's that time again, time to take a look at what the next season's artifact will bring to the table when taking on ferocious enemies and baking treats with space grandma, the rest of the tower. Here to chat more about what players can expect is Sandbox design lead, Rodney Thompson. So from Rodney here, each season's artifact has focused on one of the light subclasses, reinforcing and enhancing the 3.0 updates that players have been tinkering with throughout 2022. In season 19, it's time to give a little love to Stasis. As we've always done in the final season of the year, you'll see some reprisals, some reimaginings, and some more experimentation. The season 19 artifact will have anti-champion mods for hand cannons, scout rifles, bows, pulse rifles, auto rifles, and submachine guns, as well as return of the unstoppable grenade launcher mod. Just in time for that prospector buff, the Lucent Finisher mod will also return to help you generate some heavy ammo, which was a fantastic mod. We've also got some new twists on a few old favorites, including a version of Passive Guard that works with glaives and a reprisal of Reach and Clear designed to interact with the Void 3.0 rework. Holy hell, it's gonna be a grenade launcher meta, fellas. Reach and Clear was so good. Again, just damaging a boss or a champion causes them to take increased damage. And if I remember correctly, I think it was like a 30% debuff. We're also trying out some experimental mods that don't follow our usual patterns. Be on the lookout for artifact mods for the chest and leg slots that grant bonuses to resilience and mobility, respectively. We also have a helmet mod that grants additional airborne effectiveness to weapons that you are wielding. The monochromatic maestro mod in the class item slot rewards you generously for using weapons and subclasses that match their damage types. We've even included a mod aimed specifically at solo players, which should be very useful in tackling those legend lost sectors to get just the right role on that exotic that you're looking for. Ah, so like an artifact mod that influences stat distributions. All right, now community created, community voted, choose your Arbalest. Back in August, we opened the gates for guardians to vote on which exotic weapon gets a shiny new ornament. The adventure winner was none other than Arbalest. Since then, we've got straight to work with the community artists to whip up some crafting new designs. After pouring over potential designs, three potential concepts for new ornaments emerge. As for which one will win, well, that's up to you. Behind door number one, we have Historic. Okay, look good, look good. Door number two, we have Black Armory. Oh, you're pulling on my heartstrings, Bungie. And door number three, we have Synthweave. Oh my God, that looks so good. Guys, I think Synthweave. I'm just saying, I, I don't know. It's the pink and the purple. We're also going into Lightfall. It just makes sense, right? We're literally going to a city called Neo Muna. This ornament was meant for that. Now, Guardians, you can vote through a special email coming out on December the 5th, alongside a highlight of your season 18 moments. Check those spam folders. And for those having trouble getting emails, check out this resource here for potential workarounds while the team continues to investigate and weigh in when you can, because the winning ornament will be announced in the December 15th TWAM before we head into 2023. Outside of that, we also have some prime loot, including Sturm, if you don't have it, as well as a Sturm ornament, a Sparrow, and a ship. Last call also for destination materials, in case you missed it in an earlier TWAM. Starting in season 19, players will no 
longer be able to obtain the following destination materials. Just like shards, battle lattice, helium filaments, all these guys, those are being deprecated. Again, go to the tower, turn them in, either for upgrade modules or through our community event. Now, as a final note here from Bungie, that was another lengthier twab. Well, we hope you enjoyed what the different teams had to share today. Only a few more twabs left of the year, with December 15th being the final one before we get to be all cheesy and say, see you next year. At least to everyone until someone finally decides to punch us. Before we let y'all go, a small sneak peek into next week's twab includes more creative ways to get your stealth on with Ubisoft's announcement. We're getting those ovens ready for Space Grandma and a traceable outline of previous updates that you want to keep in mind for the road ahead. It'll be a good time, especially with all those cookies. We can't wait to get festive with everyone again to ring in a new year the right way. But while you're guzzling down all those space cookies, just your reminder to remember to drink that water, prioritize that self-care, and always lead with your kindness foot forward. See you next time, friends. I should go love hippie. Guys, this has been one heck of a twop, the final twop of this season. And I hope next week is going to be hella hyped. I'm very much looking forward to all these changes. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of these. Again, we will be live all next week over at twitch.tv slash askcross, playing the new content, testing out all the sandbox changes. So feel free to come by, guys, and hang out. Fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.